Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Asaf Blubstein. I'm a solution architect at N0. Can... Yeah, OK. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everything is still, uh, is still there. Um, so today, I want to talk about, uh, about infrastructure as code and just kind of how to navigate the, all the different tools and processes that are, uh, are out there. Just quick show of hands, who's using infrastructure as code today on a daily basis? Who's considering using it? Um, okay, interesting. It's, it's a, a, good, uh, a good percentage. Uh, usually DevOps is, uh, is an interesting uh, field. I get uh, very different uh, percentages every single time I, I talk about this. So, one of the main reasons and drivers of infrastructure as code is the fact that our applications have grown a lot more complex. I remember 15, 20 years ago, applications were, even if they had multiple tiers, a complex application would usually be three tiers. Maybe each tier will have a couple of virtual machines, a couple of bare metal servers, and it was still relatively easy to manage it all using stack of papers and procedures and maybe a wiki when it, those first uh, started coming out. But today, with all of our cloud-native architectures, applications comprised of microservices, pods, virtual machines, um, functions, there's just something that is very hard to manage when in in the same way that we manage those monolith applications and servers. So just and in addition, the need to scale those up and down to create things on demand and testing environments, et cetera, made the, um, the methods that we had before a lot more challenging. So the industry has started shifting to infrastructure as code. So instead of click ops, instead of having in actual people go and type and sorry and go to a UI or CLI, type commands or click buttons, instead of that, we have uh, what we see on the left, which is simply code. Now, infrastructure as code can mean different things to different is show of hands, if I have, um, let's say, CloudFormation or Terraform, is that infrastructure as code? Yes or no, show of hands, okay? If I have a PowerShell script, is that infrastructure as code? Why not? It's code, it's codified. I can put it in Git, no problem there. Um, this is really where people start to get into semantics, but the main thing about infrastructure as code, and it doesn't matter what code you write it in, if it's scripts, if it's declarative, it's, if it's imperative, the benefits that, uh, that it provides us is that everything is documented. I don't have to, um, to necessarily track all my changes in, in change management. It's still good in a lot of enterprises but everything I do is tracked in um, what used to be saved for developer workflows, but that means Git, pull requests, um, et cetera. And if we look at the, kind of like the history of infrastructure as code, the concept while really um, became a lot more popular and a lot more common in the, over the last maybe 10 years or so, this is something that is going back um, um, uh, a, long, uh, a long ways. And we can see all of the different options that we have. So if, I don't know how many of us have here have heard or used Chef or Puppet, those were, the, were extremely popular, kind of like the first Two that started the declarative versus imperative approach based on Ruby. Um, 
bit cumbersome to manage at first and a bit hard to, to integrate. But CloudFormation, I think, was the first one that really made it popular, that um, brought it into the mainstream of a way to manage AWS as, um, as infrastructure as code, or as code, apologize. And then from there, we see a lot of the different tools that we, that we are using today. Ansible, Terraform, OpenTofu, Bicep, Pulumi, et cetera. Um, now, challenge here is with all of those different tools that we saw, how do we make sure that we select the tools that, that fit us? Which ones do you choose? If you need to start implementing something right now, how do you, um, uh, how do you select the correct tool for the job? How do you make sure that you have security compliance, that it can scale, that um, not only performance-wise, but also to the different clouds, different products that you are going um, that you are going to leverage in your ecosystem. So, show of hands, how many have used Terraform here? Is there anyone that hasn't heard of Terraform? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Terraform is one of uh, the more, I would say, probably the most common. You see, and what we, when people say infrastructure as code, is one of the first ones uh, that uh, come up. It started uh, in 2012 by a company called um, HashiCorp. It's the main thing, and one of the main benefits of HashiCorp is that it is declarative, meaning that I don't have to specify um, exactly how to get to where I want. All I need to specify is the, my desired state. I want three EC2 instance, instances and five Lambda functions and a Cosmo DB in, uh, in Azure, and it will deploy it for me. Um, one of the main benefits, for me at least, when I first started using Terraform, I came to DevOps from the ops side, so while I have a little bit of um, software engineering experience, it was never my main role. Um, and the configuration language was very easy, uh, was very easy to, to learn, and the syntax was very easy to, to understand. It has a very large community, but one of the biggest um, advantages is that it builds its, it, its own dependency graph, so if you have services and resources that depend on each other, it will map it for you, so you don't have to think about it in a procedural way, and it's very, very modular. It's not only cloud agnostic, it's resource agnostic. It doesn't matter if my resource is come from AWS, if they come from Azure, or if they come from Datadog. There's even uh, Terraform provider to order your own Domino's pizzas. So it's very, very uh, robust. Um, with that, it also provides some sort of configuration management with state. So it knows that its source of truth is your code, it's its state, and you can, um, you can verify that and run speculative changes compared to your existing infrastructure and identifying drift. With that, of course, there are some downsides. How do you manage your state? Where do you keep it? Is it encrypted? It's not. Everything is in clear text. That is a big challenge if you need to store passwords, if you need to store um, any sensitive uh, information. And there are also some concerns about the fact that of the license change that um, happened in August and the potential acquisition uh, by IBM. Now, if we put that, for example, against CloudFormation, right? CloudFormation was one of the first, uh, actually, the, I just uh, listened to a great interview with the founder of Terraform and HashiCorp. And actually, CloudFormation is what sparked the idea for Terraform. CloudFormation is simple YAML, simple JSON. 
Um, it's very tightly integrated with AWS. It has great documentation, great development, but it only supports AWS as an endpoint. So even if you're an AWS shop today, what if tomorrow you're going multi-cloud or you have other resources? You need to figure out a way to, um, uh, to identify that. Another um, downside of CloudFormation is that it has no state management. So if right now its source of truth is my last run, if I make changes manually, it won't override them, it won't detect them. I need to basically build that into my logic. So it's not exactly declarative as it would be uh, with running Terraform. But if you're purely an AWS shop, this might be a very easy thing to, um, to get on board with. Um, if we look at some, some other concept, has anyone here ever heard of Pulumi? Is familiar with Pulumi? Used it? Okay. Pulumi is a very interesting um, um, uh, infrastructure as code framework that basically allows you to, if, if Terraform, if cloud formations use their own specific languages, Pulumi allows you to what we call a DSL or domain specific language, allows you to use just programming languages. So it has support for Python, for TypeScript, um, et cetera. Some of the benefits there, if, you, if your organization already has an existing code framework that it's adopting, you don't need to teach anyone a new language. They already have a skill, they just need to bring different packages. With that, there come advantages that usually DSLs, like, um, like um, I think it was, uh, if I correctly, it was Chef that had uh, the, the DSL and Terraform. There might be some limitations to the logic that you have to build otherwise. With, if you're writing in Python, I have no problem writing loops, writing conditionals, writing classes. I can have uh, as much flexibility as I have when I write my own uh, programs. It is also very cloud agnostic. It actually uses a lot of the, the uh, it, some of it for the provider are its own. Some of them are, um, using uh, Terraform's providers, so you have the flexibility of actually being multi-cloud, multi-resources as, <clears throat> as much as you want. It also has state management. It's a lot more secure than there's native uh, TLS encryption for in transit. There's native um, uh, state management as well that is encrypted, so it's a lot more secure in that way. Um, but it might require a lot more investment from your ops team if they are not familiar with, um, with coding languages. For me, for example, not coming from, uh, not having vast experience, and I was never a Python developer by trade. I have some projects that I did, some, uh, um, some things that I did for my home lab, but right now, I don't know how quickly I can onboard, how, it, so, and especially if maybe you're not using Python, you're using TypeScript, for example, you're bringing in a developer that, uh, <laughs> that uh, is not familiar with TypeScript, that's a learning curve, okay? Um, one of the benefits of Pulumi as well, it's, it's open source. It's, not, it's still company owned, but it's, uh, it's open source at the moment. And we, from that, we'll go to another open source um, solution. Uh, I will um, just be completely frank. I work for a company that's uh, called N0, and we are one of the maintainers of OpenTofu. So uh, this is not an OpenTofu presentation, but I just want to make sure that in full transparency, I, I, um, uh, I provide all the information. Is anyone familiar with OpenTofu? So basically, OpenTofu is the open source fork of Terraform. So Terraform started as open source, um, changed its license to, uh, to business license in August, which started uh, a whole um, 
whole process and some issues with the industry that I can talk about um, outside of this, uh, this specific presentation. Uh, but that brought in um, a community fork. Now, a community fork that is actively maintained and does it, on one hand, provides drop-in replacement, so exactly the same benefits that we have with Terraform, the same provider being agnostic, but also because it's community maintained, some improvements in terms, for example, of security. Now we have native state encryption. Now we have a bit more modular and um, uh, um, kind of like dynamic module configuration, things that have been asked by the community for a long time and were not uh, were not implemented. So there are some improvements. There are, of course, some, some drawbacks because this is still relatively new. There still might be concern about adopting a fully open source, something that is maintained by a foundation and not necessarily a, um, a commercial, uh, commercial company. And because of that, also, the community for it is of course, growing, but still smaller than uh, Terraform's uh, community. And from, from there, we'll go to a slightly different type of infrastructure as code, right? We'll go more to the kind of like the configuration management aspect of it. Um, has anyone here used Ansible? Yeah, <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> that was one of the first things that uh, we've ever used. Um, when I started using infrastructure as code. Uh, it's built in Python. The configuration language is, is YAML. It's, it's very procedural in its configuration, meaning you need to kind of like build in those dependencies in, um, in uh, your runtime. It is agentless, so it does everything by SSH, which has its drawbacks and um, as well, because on one hand, I don't have to maintain an agent. On the other hand, I have to have SSH open. Without SSH, it's very difficult to get uh, Ansible to work. And in addition, no state management, so it has to kind of like rerun everything every single time and not compare it to an existing state. A similar solution that also does uh, configuration management is, is Salt, and that um, does work with clients. Uh, we're kind of like a, a server agent base. That does mean that we have to maintain things, but also, um, but also, it provides us with just a little bit of faster configuration and a bit more robust and sometimes a bit more secure because we don't have to open SSH to the world. It is, it is fully open source, by, but was bought out by VMware, which was then bought out by Broadcom, so there are some concerns there about the state of the, the project. And that wasn't supposed to be there, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so that is just kind of like the, the beginning. Like we have, we just talked about six different, um, six different IACs, but there's a lot more out there. So how do we choose what is the best IAC? And the answer is, as always, that it really depends, right? There's no one single IAC tool. There are things that each one of them does very well. For example, Terraform, OpenTOFU are great at bringing up the infrastructure. Ansible, Salt are great at continuing that configuration once it's, it's built. So the real question is what, as always, is evaluating your own needs and requirements, right? Which clouds are you deploying to? What is the current skill set of your uh, developers, of your DevOps team? Are they uh, using a code base, you know, are they heavily, is everyone coding in Python? Maybe then Pulumi is a great, uh, a great option. Maybe Ansible can complement that because Ansible can, um, can also uh, support Python. So the important thing is really to understand all of these different strengths, the pros and cons that we talked about, and making sure that we have some that fit uh, our needs. So once we 
did that, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit later, how do we make sure that we operationalize those? Because today we talked about all of, all of these different ISCs. Tomorrow there might be a, the latest and greatest that is coming out. So the important thing is that we need to make sure that we implement a pipeline that has different policies uh, that match our organizational needs. For example, policy as code, to be able to codify approvals and, um, and policies such as PCI, HIPAA, uh, et cetera. If you're familiar with Open Policy Agent, it's a very modular policy as code, fully open source, that can manage different policies for Terraform, Ansible, Kubernetes, um, et cetera. Building um, Lint and security checks into your pipeline as well. So Chekhov, for example, is a great uh, free tool that is out there that can support a lot of these, um, these multi-platforms and multi-IAC. But of course, things like TFLint, TFSec, Aqua Security, et cetera, can also be used and depending on the specific IAC that we, that we select. And cost estimation and monitoring, especially as we're doing things with code, with cloud, that it's very easy to over deploy and have resource sprawl and cost sprawl. Shifting those, those left with tools like InfraCost that you can run and actually see the potential cost of your changes and monitor those after it's being deployed really helps reduce the, uh, the total cost of your DevOps operation. So again, building that into kind of like a unified DevOps approach where you write your code, ideally merge it using uh, PRs, do different checks and validations into your CICD pipeline, have approvals based on the individual teams and what is needed, and then continue that cycle as you, um, um, as you update your code and your infrastructure. And with that, of course, it doesn't have to be everything at once. Understand where your organization, where your team is standing, and integrate those in a modular way that can help your team and your organization grow, and ideally have um, a consistent process where you add tools to it as uh, you continue to grow. And I think I'll stop on the summary slide, but I think uh, we'll have, um, I think we have some time for questions. Questions, anyone? About the process, any of the tools that we talked about, any of the specific platforms. Just a quick question about the open tofu and the comparison with uh, uh, Terraform. Yeah. Does open tofu support all of the modules that Terraform has available? Uh, yeah, the provider is the same. Oh, yeah. The providers are the same, and the language is the same. So, and mm -hmm. you don't even have to change anything on the state. I'd be happy to um, talk a little bit more about the. the re it's a, it is a different registry, but it's. Mm -hmm mirrored, basically. Okay. Um, that's just a legal thing. There's some very interesting presentations from the creators of that registry. Um, if you just look up uh, in KubeCon um, Europe, there were a couple of talks about kind of like the process of building that, uh, that open source project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more? All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.